you could just quickly turn with me to Acts chapter 29. Are you there? Are you there? You're not there. Why? You're not there. Now, this is the problem with a disobedient congregation. Are you in Acts chapter 29? Why are you not there? Because it is not there. In your Bibles. Okay? Do you know why it's not there? Do you know why it's not there? Because you are the next chapter. You are the next chapter in the history of the church. You are the next chapter. It was not written by Luke. Because it was meant to be written by you. It was meant to be written by your life. It was meant to be written today. We are the next chapter in the history of the church. Luke ends his account of the journey and the story of the church abruptly. And it looks like this book is unfinished. But it is not a mistake. Luke allows the book to remain unfinished because his intention was to communicate that the story of the church is not yet over. It's not yet finished. This story of the church has many more players. And many of those players are here today. The story of the church has many more churches that it needed to be planted, apart from the ones that we see in the book of Acts. There are more miracles to be experienced and to be encountered. There is so much more territory to be covered than the territory that is described in the book of Acts. And Luke finishes his account abruptly to communicate to us that he has now passed on the baton to you and he has passed on the baton to me. We are the next chapter of the history of the church. The book of Acts carries on with me. The book of Acts carries on with you. My life is an epistle. It is a letter that is going to be read by millions and millions in my lifetime that effectively will communicate the gospel to them and will allow them to come to the realization of who our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, is. And just to be able to close our time in the book of Acts, please turn to someone next to you and tell them, you are Acts chapter 29. All right? You and I are Acts chapter 29, the next chapter in the history of the church. But just before we got there, even before chapter 29, which is you and I, Remember, we had finished around chapter 20. Let me just fill in that gap before we close our time in the book of Acts. What we see between chapter 21 of the book of Acts to chapter 26 is something very interesting. Remember last Sunday, we talked about how Paul had finished the second missionary journey. He had come from Ephesus and Asia Minor. Amazing victories and amazing things had happened. In chapter 21 of the book of Acts, Paul finds himself in jail. In Jerusalem, in accordance to the vision that had been given to Agabus, he is arrested and he is put in jail in Jerusalem. What surprises me is that Luke gives this imprisonment an elaborate account. He gives the imprisonment of Paul in Jerusalem six chapters in the book of Acts from chapter 21 all the way to chapter 26 we see an elaborate account of how Paul was imprisoned. During these six chapters, we don't see any new churches planted. We don't see any new theological or difficult problems resolved as we had seen previously. Instead, Paul spends two years in jail. Initially in Jerusalem, 
after that in Caesarea, in that area, but he spends his time in jail. We see Paul being brought before the Sanhedrin. We see Paul being brought before Governor Felix. We see Paul being brought before Governor Felix's successor, who was called Festus. We see Paul being brought before Festus's friend, called Agrippa. And we see Paul having five different public appearances where he has to defend himself and defend his faith. That's what happens between chapter 21 all the way to chapter 26 of the book of Acts. Then we see chapter 27 where Paul appeals to the governor and says, I want to appeal to Caesar. I want to appeal to Caesar and he's given the opportunity to set sail from Jerusalem, across the Mediterranean, all the way to Italy, go in all the way towards Rome. He goes to uh, make an appeal to Caesar. And we see him setting sail, and he sails for Rome. But that trip is interrupted, because he set sail during the winter, where the Mediterranean Sea was rough, and he gets shipwrecked, and he spends three months on the island of Malta. He needed to spend three months for the winter to end so that he can set sail when the sea was calm so that he could be able to go all the way to Rome to find an opportunity to make his appeal to Caesar. But what happens in Rome, that is what covers the last chapters of the book of Acts. The Bible says he was placed under house arrest in Rome. And his final days and the final events that are recorded in the scriptures in Acts chapter 28 is Paul under house arrest where he could receive different visitors, where he could continue to share the gospel. Although he could not get out, people could come in and sit at his feet and he could be able to share with them. It is during this time of house arrest that he managed to write most of the letters to most of the churches as we see it in the New Testament. We see the book of Acts unceremoniously end abruptly end with Paul under house arrest for two years in Rome. By this time, the kingdom of God had spread through all the parts of the Roman Empire. This journey that we all know that began in Pentecost, this journey that continued with the martyrdom of Stephen, the conversion of Saul, the establishment of the church in Antioch that ministered specifically to the Gentile believers, the first missionary journey, the Jerusalem conference that we, uh, or the council in Jerusalem that we read about in Acts chapter 15, and the amazing clarification of what salvation is all about. We see the second missionary journey happen even after that. But we see during these journeys, Paul begins to write to the churches. During the first missionary journey, Paul writes to the Thessalonians. He writes first and second Thessalonians while he was still literally in Corinth. During the second missionary journey, we see Paul writing, continues to write while in Ephesus, he writes to the Galatians, to the Corinthians. In Macedonia, he writes second Corinthians, but while he was in Ephesus, he wrote first Corinthians. In Corinth, we see him writing during the time he went back to Corinth, he finally wrote to the Romans while he was in Corinth. We see Paul beginning to write these letters to the churches as he continues to encourage them and based on the reports that he's getting from the churches. Finally, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. He's arrested and taken to jail in Caesarea. And we see him writing the letters to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians. He writes Philemon. He writes First and Second Timothy and Titus while in prison, while in jail. And Luke concludes... What are the 30 most dramatic years in church history? He concludes in chapter 28 at the end of the book of Acts. From the humble beginnings of a few disciples in an upper room where the Holy Spirit descended upon them, we see this message now spreading throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. And we see over church history, the message of the gospel has been unstoppable. The advance of the church has overcome so many obstacles and has continued one generation after the other. It initially started with absolutely no money, people that had no training, people that faced great op opposition, territories that were so harsh and that was so hard. But the gospel was unstoppable. The church was unstoppable. How? 
did the disciples achieve this? How did they achieve this difficult feat of ensuring that the gospel that they were entrusted was unstoppable? Today, I want us to reflect upon this. And as we close the book of Acts, to look at the nature of this early church and how this early church managed to allow the gospel to continue unstoppably. How did they make this possible? There was four characteristics of the early church that I want us to reflect on so that we could challenge ourselves at the book of Acts because if these four characteristics do not exist in an Acts chapter 29 church, then we will compromise the advance of the gospel. It's because these four characteristics existed in the early church in Acts that the church became unstoppable. And to draw these characteristics, I'm going to go back to the verse we started with. In the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, where Jesus gives a commission to the church that defines for the church how the church should be able to reach the world. Let's read together that verse in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 before we draw these characteristics. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Can we say this together? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit of the earth. I suggest to us that from this passage of scripture, this verse, that we see four distinct things that defined the early church that made it unstoppable, that made it, uh, made the gospel of Jesus Christ unconquerable and the church unstoppable. And if we had these characteristics, we would be the same. The first one is community. Their connection with one another. The second one is content. Their saturation by the Holy Spirit. The third one is commitment. The demonstration of amazing boldness and sacrifice. And the last one is commission. Direction by the commanding officer Jesus Christ that had a church that was committed to obedience, was bound to the commands of the commanding officer himself, Jesus Christ. Let me quickly reflect on each of these with us. Number one, community. Community. They had a connection with each other. The verse we've read begins by saying, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me. Jesus was already speaking to a community that had gathered together and he told them together, go and wait for me in Jerusalem, in the upper room. Together, not alone, together, united as a unit. And wait upon me for the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. There is a power of unity that the early church discovered that was central and instrumental to them transforming the world. The disciples were together. They received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit together. They served together. They were witnesses together. They were one. They were united. And they became a transformational force because of their unity. Their common unity. Because if as one we embarked on any venture, not alone, but if as one we stood together with our hands together, with us undivided, then we are unstoppable. Jesus Christ knew this. And even his final prayer for the church in John chapter 17, his final prayer that the church would be one. Because he knew that if the church was one, we would be unstoppable. And the enemy knows this. That's why the greatest thing the enemy is trying to attack in the church is our unity. Our common unity. If we are united, we will fulfill Acts chapter 29. And this is the first thing that we see in the body of Christ. A deep, unconquerable unity that resulted in their ability to conquer all the other lands that God had given them. But this unity was not just people coming together. This unity, I suggest to us, was people coming together with a common posture. There is a posture that the early church had 
in their unity that if we had the same posture, we would be unconquerable as a church. Number one, this posture had an upward posture. They had an inward posture and they had an outward posture. By upward posture, I simply mean they had experienced God deeply. They were encountering God in prayer. They were encountering God in worship. They celebrated God's power among, among them. They were committed to uphold and to exalt God in everything. They were focused on God. They were focused on what God could do. They were focused on their relationship with God. Their inward posture is how the gospel radically transformed them into a new creation. They were not the same. Their view of their possessions had changed. Their view of what they owned had changed. And they were willing to give up all that they owned so that the gospel could be able to advance. They did not hold on to anything anymore because they recognized that God owns everything. Their view of their gifts had changed. Their view of their abilities had changed. They had become new people. They had become a new creation. The gospel had defined their identity. They had an inward posture that was changed. Their compassion, their humility, their joy, their concern, their courage, their boldness, they had been changed from the inside. So they had an upward posture, but they also had an inward posture. But they did not just move towards God or move towards each other. They moved towards the world. They had an outward posture. They were passionate and committed to be able to express the word of God to all that were around them. I suggest to us that where their outward posture is concerned, there are three things that became the medium of power in the early church. Their message, the message of the good news. They used the message of the good news to share with the world. But the second thing they used is the model of their transformed life. Their new life became a model to others of what it means to be a Christian. That's why in Acts chapter, 20, chapter 11, they were called Christians in Antioch. Because people noticed that what defined them was Christ. They were truly modeling Christ. But the third one is their community made them a magnet. People wanted to be part of the church because of the genuine concern the church had. Because of the genuine love the church had. People desired to belong to that community. And they became a magnet to the world because of their transformational community. Their common unity became a tool for the advancement of the gospel. And it made the early church unstoppable. Church, our unity as a church will continue to make the church in Kenya unstoppable. Let us not allow the enemy to come in and divide us as a church based on doctrinal preferences here and there or practices of the faith. We believe in our God and our King. This is what makes us one. Many of us have allowed denominational divisions to come and divide us and yet we believe in the one and only Savior together, and we believe in his word. Our unity is our strength. The second thing that we see is their content. Not just their community, but their content. They were saturated by the Holy Spirit. When God established the church, the first thing that God gave the church was not good ideas. The first thing that God gave the church was the power of the Holy Spirit. Because God knew that an engine without fuel is useless. And he gave the church the fuel of the Holy Spirit to propel the witness of the church to the world. The book of Acts is actually the acts of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit did in the church. Within the book of Acts, there are 56 references to the Holy Spirit. In this one book alone. In the entire New Testament, there are 90 references to the Holy Spirit. In one book of the New Testament is more than half the references of the Holy Spirit in the entire New Testament. It's resident in one book. The place of the Holy Spirit is central to the church being unstoppable. And we need to get to the place where we allow the church to be the place where you see the demonstration 
of the Holy Spirit at work in people's lives individually and in the corporate worship of the church. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to work. We can only do this if we continue to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Some of us, and I said this some time ago, some of us think you get more and more of the Holy Spirit. I believe that when you become a, a believer, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes complete, intact, whole, complete, thoroughly. The reason why you say I'm being filled with the Holy Spirit is because I get into the process of being emptied of myself. And when you see less of me, that's when you see more of him. And the, jo the, the, the most difficult thing for a Christian is not to receive more of the Holy Spirit. He comes complete. But the job of the Christian is to continue to surrender more of himself to the Holy Spirit. And to let the Holy Spirit take over more and more of you. And at the end of the day, you can say, I am full of the Holy Spirit because I am empty of me. And that's what God is calling us to do as a church. To empty ourselves. So that God has his way in our families. So that God has his way in every aspect of our lives. All our service to God is dependent on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You look through the book of Acts and you see God at work in the body of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. What Luke is ultimately saying is that our service to God... And the service and the acts of God in the book of Acts were produced by the Holy Spirit and powered by the Holy Spirit. There's someone called A.C. Dixon that said this. When you rely on organization, you get what only organization can do. When you rely on education, you get what only education can do. When you rely on eloquence, you get what only eloquence can do. But when you rely on the Holy Spirit, you get what only the Holy Spirit can do. And I think this reflects what the early church did. They relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. And what do you get? What the Holy Spirit could do is what happened. It made the church unstoppable. Many of us know the first letter that Paul wrote is probably 1 Thessalonians. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5, the very first words that Paul wrote to the church were this. He says, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul, in his writing to the church, reminded the church the one thing that would propel the church to make it unstoppable is the power of the Holy Spirit. The third thing I see in the early church is commitment. Commitment. The demonstration of boldness and the demonstration of sacrifice. The verse we read says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will will be my witnesses. Where does boldness to be a witness for Christ come from? It comes from the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Where does courage come from? It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. Why did martyrs in church history, why were they able to sing in the midst of flames while their bodies were burning, but they were singing? singing, 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 celebrating God. This was no ordinary power. There's a boldness and there's a commitment that we see in the early church that came from the Holy Spirit. From the moment they received and they believed, they chose to pick up their cross, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and said our commitment to God is unshakable. Peter and John were imprisoned and beaten in chapter 4 of Acts. All the apostles were imprisoned and beaten and threatened in chapter 5. Stephen was stoned in chapter 7. We see the believers scattered in chapter 8. People 
faced the hardship of leaving their homes, leaving their jobs, leaving their possessions. They were not deterred by that, but they left it because of the persecution for them to go all the way to Antioch and different places for them to continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In all the cases that we see of the spread of the gospel, there is a level of resistance that the early church experienced to be able to communicate this message. The question that I'd like to ask us today is this. The disciples held nothing back from God. Not even their own lives. They surrendered everything they had to God. We see Stephen being stoned to death. We see John being dropped into a pot of boiling oil head first for the sake of the gospel. We see Peter being crucified upside down because he said, I'm not worthy to be able to die like Jesus Christ. We see James being beheaded early in the book of Acts. We see Thomas being driven a spear right through his body for the sake of Christ. We see Bartholomew being flayed in his flesh as strips of his flesh were removed, one strip after the other, when he's being asked, will you deny Jesus? And he said, no, I will not deny Jesus. I'm committed to him. Regardless how much flesh you remove from my body, I am committed to Jesus Christ. You see Alphaeus, uh, sorry, James, the son of Alphaeus, being clubbed to death as he died for the sake of the faith. What is Jesus Christ worth to you? What is he worth to you? That's the question that the disciples asked themselves. And that is the question that resulted in their undivided commitment to Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ worth to you? If Jesus Christ was asked that same question, what am I worth to Jesus Christ? His answer is simple. I am worth everything to him. And that's why Jesus Christ gave his life for me. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary for me. Because I was worth everything to him. And the same person that died on the cross for my sin is asking me the same question. Am I, what is he worth to me? What am I holding back from Jesus? What is Jesus asking me to commit to him that I am holding back? The disciples had resolved to give him anything that he needed. And that defined the church that was unstoppable in the book of Acts. The last one is I see a church that was embarked on a commission. They had bound themselves to obedience. They had bound themselves to the obedience of their commanding officer, Jesus Christ himself. The verse we read says, and you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. They listened to Jesus Christ as disciples and they immediately obeyed. They did not negotiate and figure out what Jesus Christ wanted. They said, what Jesus Christ has said, we will do. They were clear about the command that Jesus Christ gave them. And they knew their job description. They knew their terms of reference. We all have the same commanding officer. And the same commanding officer has given the same church, the same commission to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the same marching orders that Jesus Christ gave the early church. The question is, do we have the same heart of obedience? Do we have the same inclination to obey what he has said and to make a commitment to disciple somebody else? To make a commitment to walk with somebody else through their faith. The commission is one. The command is one. But the hearts are different. Do we have a heart of obedience like the early church that was inclined to obedience? The last message that we're preaching today on the book of Acts is the transition of the church. 
We started with the foundations of the church. We looked at the persecution of the church, the discussion of the church. We've gone through many, many stages in the past few weeks. We've looked at the expansion, the mission, the discussion, the tension. Today's is the transition of the church. I want to close this series by saying the transition of the church is you. You are the one God has given the opportunity to write the next chapter. The next chapter of the book of Acts is being written by us, by our lives. But the question I'm asking us is, do, do I have the same heart of obedience as the early church? Do I have the same inclination to obey the Great Commission as the early church? Do I have the same demonstration of sacrifice? Or what am I holding back? Is my commitment shaky? Content. Have I allowed the Holy Spirit to take over my entire life? To take over my heart and to become truly in charge of my life? Have I given and surrendered myself to the Holy Spirit and community connection with one another? This is the object of the prayer that I'd like us to make at the end of this series. And if you could put up that slide, the summary slide of community, content, commitment, and commission. Which area is God challenging you about so that we could fulfill the great commission? Which of these is God speaking to you about? Is it about the unity within the body of Christ? It could be the unity in your family. It could be the unity in your e-group. It could be the unity right here in the body of Christ. Are we contributing to our togetherness or are we allowing the church to be divided? Is it our content? Are we surrendering ourselves day by day and allowing the Holy Spirit to take over each and every detail of our lives? Is it our commitment? Are there things we've withheld from God? And God is asking us to reflect our measure of sacrifice based on what he is worth to us. And finally, have we obeyed? Are we making disciples? Are we walking with others to fulfill the great commission? Are we sharing our faith to the people that are around us? Shall we bow our heads as we respond to God in prayer? Why don't you just make a prayer in your heart right now regarding any of those areas that God has challenged us about that reflected the nature of the early church. We recognize the church is not a building. It's not even a place. The church is people. And the most important thing is that each and every one of us are walking in that same direction. I pray that we make a commitment to God today in each of those areas so that we become an Acts 29 church, the church that is fulfilling and accomplishing the work of the Great Commission across the world. So, Father, we come to the end of this book. As excited as Luke was, as he looked ahead to the future of the church, knowing that the right foundation had been laid and now the church was unstoppable. I pray that in our generation, we will not compromise the advancement of the gospel. I pray that in our generation, we will reflect this Acts 29 church that is able to truly fulfill and to accomplish the Great Commission. Father, I pray that you allow us to each make independent yet corporate commitments so that at the end of the day, Nairobi Chapel could contribute to the work of advancing the gospel across the world. We know the mandate that you've given the church in Africa to now be able to be a new epoch on, on missions, to be able to go across the world and to be able to advance the gospel in this era. Father, this is our time. And I pray that we as a church will not be kept napping, will not be found napping, but we will be ready with the commitment that it takes, with the inclination to obey the Great Commission, with a true demonstration of the work of the Holy Spirit, and at the end of the day, with a unity that is unconquerable. So we dedicate ourselves to be that church and for the glory and for the honor of your name. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week.